Greetings, Nick with Sweetwater here, and today we're going to learn the main riffs of a song that's been a staple of American rock radio for over 45 years. The Blue Oyster Cult classic, Don't Fear the Reaper. I'm sorry, that's wrong. I've messed up. Oh. Nick, when you're teaching everybody to play Don't Fear the Reaper, please use more cowbell, you dummy. Pow! Got it! Sorry, guys. I totally messed up there. Like an idiot, I mixed the backing track totally wrong. But don't worry, it's an easy fix. Let me quickly hook up my handy-dandy looper pedal, and we'll do it again. Let's rock this. Yeah, I know, I'm sorry. Totally cheeseball, 110% predictable, and pathetic too for that matter, but it had to be done. Anyway, stupidity over, on to the lesson. Don't Fear the Reaper was written and sung by Blue Oyster Cult's lead guitarist Buck Dharma and appeared on the band's 1976 album, Agents of Fortune. Buck wrote and recorded a demo of Don't Fear the Reaper at home after getting a four-track tape machine. The lyrics were inspired by a brush with mortality the guitar player had after his doctor diagnosed that he had a heart rhythm issue. Thankfully, it turned out not to be life-threatening, but it did inspire this great song's lyrics. When Buck presented it to the rest of the band, they initially thought it was a little on the light and poppy side compared to their typically heavier fare. That said, they really liked the song, so decided to put it on the album. The last thing to be recorded... The cowbell, of course, the icing on an already soon to be legendary cake. The album version of this song clocks in at just over five minutes. That said, the band's record label saw the song's hit potential, so committed the awful act of cutting out the epic solo section to make it short enough to be a single. This unthinkable sin shortened the song by over a minute, it was released as a single, and it quickly became a massive hit. And the rest, as the saying goes, is hard rock history. Backstory over. Let's learn this classic, shall we? First up is that instantly recognizable repeated two-bar intro and verse riff. This one. We're gonna call that riff one. And it's not too hard to play as it's only three partial two-finger chords and some open string notes. Let's get going. The first chord shape is this one. Like I said, two fingers. I'm using my second and third fingers to fret this one. My middle finger is holding down the E note at the second fret on the D string, namely this one. And my ring finger is doing the same thing on the G string, holding down the second fret. So we've got this, which is an A. I personally view this as a partial version of one of the first open chords we all learn, A minor, namely this one. We don't pick the B string though, we just pick the open A string followed by the D and G strings, like this. That said, to be totally OCD accurate, and I'm guilty of that, we're merely playing a root fifth root power chord really here, so I could do it with one finger, just like this. And to be honest, this is something I often do out of pure power chord playing habit. Mr. Dharma though frets it like this. So that's how we're going to try and learn it. To play note number four, all you have to do is lift your finger off the G string and then pick that string open to get the open note, which is, wait for it, yep, G. So these are the first four notes of this great riff. This open G note leads us nicely into our next partial chord shape, which is another one of those first open chords we all learn, namely G, this one. Now, as luck would have it, we only pick the low E, A, D, and G strings on this one, so once again, I can play this bad boy with merely two fingers, like this. As you can hopefully see, I'm fretting this with my middle and ring fingers. The reason I'm doing this as opposed to using my first and second fingers like this, there are two reasons for this. The first is because that's the way Buck plays it, like this. 
using his middle and ring fingers. The second reason will become clear when we get to the third chord shape used in this intro. That said, let's suss out exactly what we do on the G, and I think you know what it is. Here are the next four notes in the riff. So all I'm doing here is this. I'm holding down that two-fingered G chord shape we just learned, and then I'm picking the lowest four strings from low to high, just like this. So it's E string, A string, then an open D followed by an open G. So far so good, right? This means our first eight notes are these. One more time, a little slower. Now it's time for partial two-fingered chord shape number three, which is this one. All I'm doing here is playing an F5 power chord shape with the open D and G string notes again. I guess we could call this chord F6 add 9 if we want to. I just call it the third chord in the classic Don't Feel the Reaper intro. Here it is. Now, as you can see, once again, I'm only using two digits to play this one. My index finger is at the first fret on the low E string, and my pinky is at the third fret on the A string. You could obviously use your index and ring fingers for this if you like. Whichever one you prefer and feels good is the one for you. So either this or this. The one thing you've got to be sure of, though, is making sure you've got whatever finger you're using to hold down the note on the A string arched enough so you don't mute the D by accident. You've got to be... You can't be... It's got to be a bridge. Let that open D string ring. And as I'm sure you've ascertained, the picking pattern on this shape is exactly the same as the one just before it, namely low E, then A, then the open D and G strings in that order, just like this. That means that so far, what we've got is this. Pretty simple, right? Here it is again, one more time, a little slower. For the fourth and final chord of this seminal riff, we go back to our old pal the G shape and do the exact same thing once again, namely this. And that's it, we're home free. Here's the whole riff. And once again, a little bit slower. As for the picking here, well, Mr. Buck Dharma uses strict alternate picking, namely down, up, down, up, down, up, and so on. You can, of course, pick it whichever way feels right to you, but to my ears, the riff does sound best when played the Buck way, namely alternate picking, down, up, down, up, down, up. Got it? Cool. Let's move on. Now, even though I've just shown you the most logical and economic fretboard fingering pattern for this one, namely the way Buck plays it, <laughs> To be honest, as opposed to lying, I invariably play the A shape with my first finger, like this. And that means I play the G shape with my first and second fingers, like this. Which means, of course, I actually have to move my hand to go to the F shape, like this. That's just the way I learned it way back then, and now it's muscle memory that's deeply ingrained. To be honest with you, the more economic, less movement way the way Buck fingers it is the right way to go. But once again, do what feels best to you. Now, if you haven't been playing for too long, this pesky F shape could well be your stumbling block, your Achilles heel, if you will. Now, if you find this to be the case, I'm gonna give you a hack. I don't like hacks, but this is a good one. And to be honest with you, this is how I first learned how to play this riff, because that's how I thought it was played, when I learned it from just dropping a needle on the record over and over again and using my ears. This is what I did. I didn't play the F like this. It was just a one finger here. Way easier, right? And when you play it together with the other two chords fast enough, it sounds correct. The reason it doesn't sound half bad played like this? Well, I guess it's due to the fact that the open A string note is the major third of F. 
so it sounds right. Your ultimate aim is obviously to play the F-shape the two-fingered buck way. That said, the one-fingered way should impress your friends until you master the harder one. So that's it, my friend, the main Don't Fear the Reaper riff. Done and dusted. Hurrah! You play this four times for the intro and then another four times for the verse. After that, we come to the first pre-chorus riff and I'm gonna call this riff, riff number two. This one uses four root five power chords, F5, G5, A5, and E5, and it sounds like this. Pretty simple, right? Once again, a little slower. That's not too bad, right? Let's break it into two two-bar sections. The first chunk is this one. We start with F5 at the first fret, namely this one. Then we move to G5, which is two frets higher, with my first finger at the third fret. Then we go to A5, which is another two frets higher, namely with my first finger at the fifth fret. We chug on the F5 and G5 four times each, just like this. Then we go up to the A5 at the fifth fret, like I've just shown you, and play it eight times. So once again, our first pre-chorus section is this one. Now for the most part here, I'm only hitting the low E and A strings on these chords, but I'm also fretting the D note as shown, so if I hit it, it sounds right. Because it's just the root note an octave higher. Got it? Good. Let's move on. Our next section, chunk number two of the pre-chorus, goes F5, E5, A5, and G5, with four hits on each. Now we already know F5, G5, and A5, so the only thing that's missing is E5. And this is how we're gonna play it. We're gonna do it on the open position like this. And as you can see, it's just a one-fingered affair. I've just got my index finger fretting the A and D strings at the second fret. Thus, when the low E string note is added, hey presto, we've got a nice, fat-sounding E5 chord. Nice. So, as I've just mentioned, we go F5, E5, A5, then G5, hitting each one four times, just like this. So if I join chunk one and chunks two together, we've got this. And that's it. After that, it's into the chorus and the la 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 section with some neat lead work from Buck. The chorus starts with the last half of riff one, namely these two bars. Then we go back to the main riff, riff one, and play it a weird total of nine times. Yep, you heard me, not eight times, but nine. Trust me, I'm a doctor and I can count. Then after the ninth time through riff one, we hit what sounds to me like this A minor seven shape. And we let it ring for two bars, and then we're back into another intro and verse. Now the A minor chord shape I hear is this one. This version also works as well. And this time it's merely our old friend, the open A minor shape. With the high G note added, the minor seventh played at the third fret on the high E string with your pinky. Both sound great, but I personally prefer the first shape, this one. Which is basically the second shape with your third finger lifted off so you get another G note. Yep, to me that sounds the sweeter of the two, but I could be a little biased because the minor seventh is my favorite sultry sounding chord. 
To be honest though, a regular open A minor chord like this doesn't sound half bad. Anyway, enough minor seventh talk, back to the plot. After what we've just done, we go into another intro and verse section, then we go into the pre-chorus number two, which is much longer than the first one. It starts the exact same way, namely this. But then it goes into another two bar pattern and plays it a total of three times. And we're gonna call this riff number three and this is the pattern. And like I said, that's played a total of three times. All we're doing here in riff three is this. We're going F5, G5, A5, then back to G5 and chugging each chord four times, just like this. Pretty easy, right? And we just play it three times like this. So when we add that to riff two, hey presto, we've got pre-chorus number two. And the entire thing sounds like this. That's it, pre-chorus number two. Once you've got this down, I'd strongly suggest you listen to the recorded version to get hold of Buck's exact feel in this part, because it's a pretty cool one. Now, while I'm playing both pre-choruses using downstrokes exclusively, I have seen footage of Buck reverting to alternate picking on occasions, and sometimes he doesn't even play strict eighth notes either. Listen and play what feels best to you. It's all good. Then after this, it goes back into another chorus and another la la section with some more cool lead work from Buck. So namely we do this. And then we play the main riff, riff number one, nine times again before finishing with. Yup, another A minor seven chord that rings for two bars. At this point, as already mentioned on the single version of the song, the solo section is cut out and it goes straight to the third and final verse. We're not gonna do that though, cause it's wrong. Now, while we're not gonna learn the solo in this lesson, we are gonna learn the two killer riffs that are used on the much longer album version of this great song. First up is riff number four, the killer sounding angular one that's played right before Mr. Dharma's epic solo on the album version of this classic song. We'll call this the interlude, I guess. So riff four is the interlude. Now this one consists of two three note arpeggios played on the B and high strings. And once again, the count here is a little weird, so brace yourself. We're also gonna stick with a clean tone for this bad boy too. The first repeated three note pattern is this, F, A flat, and C, which makes an F minor arpeggio. You play the F at fret six on the B string with your index finger. Then the A flat on the same string at fret nine with your pinky. Then finally, with your third or ring finger, the C at the eighth fret on the high E. Simple, right? Now, like I said, the count here is a little weird. We actually play this three note pattern a total of five times in succession, just like this. Yep, five times. Then we go straight into the next repeated three note pattern, which goes like this. F, G, B. And we play that six times. This is how it sounds. Here's how you play it. Our first note is the F at fret six on the B string again, namely this one. We then play the G two frets higher on the same string and we use our ring finger. And the final note B is at the seventh fret on the high E string and we use our middle finger to fret this bad boy. So we have this. And like I said, we repeated a total of six times, 
just like this. Yep, that was six, good. So now what we do is this, we tag this one on the end of the five repeats of the first three note pattern, and we have this. Five, then six. Here it is again, a little bit slower. We then do the same thing all over again, and then it's the solo. And like I said, the count is weird. Five repeats followed by six, and then the same exact thing again. But what a great sinister sounding section that is. It's pretty unsettling in a very cool hard rock way, and it uses a clean sound, like it. Now I have seen this section transcribed using the G, B, and high E strings for these two arpeggios like this. The first one's played like this. And the second pattern like this. Now these notes are 100% correct, but the way I just showed you just on the E and B strings, namely this one, that's the way Buck plays it. And in my opinion, it's a little easier to play and it sounds cleaner and clearer too. Now last, but certainly not least, we come to riff five, which is a repeated 10 note distorted one played underneath Buck's solo. In addition to the spooky sounding pair of arpeggios we've just learnt, of course. This is what riff five sounds like. <laughs> break this one into two bite-sized five-note chunks. Here's chunk number one. And a little slower. As you can hopefully see, it's three notes going up the low E string, followed by two going the other way on the D string. The first three on the low E are these, and I'm going to do so with a clean sound so we can hear it cleanly without any noise. Here we go. So first fret, third fret, then fourth fret, like this. As you can see, I'm playing notes two and three using my ring finger for both, like this. I'm not doing this to avoid using my pinky though, I'm doing it to get my pinky primed and ready to play the fourth note, which is at the fifth fret on the D string, like this. Now this involves us jumping over the A string, so make sure you don't hit that sucker with your pick, my mistake. It's gotta be this. That's four of the five notes in chunk one. So we've only got one more to go, and it's at the third fret on the D string, right here. And as you can see, I'm using my index finger to fret it. So here's chunk one, played with a clean sound. And again, with a dirty sound. Next up is chunk two, namely this one. This time we're playing one note on the low E string, followed by two on the A string, then two on the D, just like this. Our single low E string note is the G at the third fret, and we're gonna fret it with our middle finger. Our next two are at the second and fifth frets of the A string, namely these two. So our first three notes are chunk two of these. And as you can see, once again, it looks like I'm avoiding using my pinky by playing the D note at the fifth fret on the A string with my ring finger, like this. But, once again, just like in chunk one, I'm merely doing this so my pinky is free to play the next note, which happens to be at the sixth fret on the D string. So from there, to there. Logical, simple. This means our first four notes of chunk two are these. As for our fifth and final note of this chunk, it's at the fifth fret on the D string. 
and we're going to play it using our ring finger like this. So chunk number two is this. And again, with some desirable distortion. Playing these two chunks back to back gives us the riff we're after, namely this one. messy but you get it what a great moody riff that one is that's why i wanted to include it in this lesson they play riff five a total of four times then after the last time they do this for the very end of buck solo they go from f to g to f to g holding each one for two bars or eight counts like this <laughs> Then they clean it up and go back to the main riff, just like this. And there you have it, my friend, the main riffs for the Blois the Cult classic, Don't Fear the Reaper, including a hack for that all important first riff. Have fun with this one. And if you'd like to learn the solo, please let me know in the comments below. And enough of you say, yes, do it, then maybe I'll do it in a future edition. Anyway, don't fear this guy. And more importantly, don't forget this. I'm out. See ya! Thank you so very much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Click here for more videos like this, or start at sweetwater.com for all your music instrument and pro audio needs. Class dismissed. Off you go.